Amidst the blistering pace of AI developments today, it's hard to keep a clear head. The opportunities for businesses and investments are many, but it requires careful thought to identify potential winners. My guest today is Antoine Blondeau, founder and general partner at Alpha Intelligence Capital. As a serial entrepreneur who worked on the predecessor to Apple's Siri, he's seen a lot of the space's evolution. We spoke about his background in entrepreneurship and investing, how he sees the venture landscape changing, opportunities for AI companies to differentiate themselves, and much more. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you have comments, questions, guest suggestions, feel free to leave me a comment on Substack or shoot an email to editor at thegradient.pub. But now, without further ado, Antoine Blondeau. Antoine, before your current position founding Alpha Intelligence Capital, you had engaged in a number of entrepreneurial endeavors yourself. And I think there are a lot of interesting things to dive into here, but I'd love for you to outline the story first. Yeah, you know, I've been in the um, so-called AI space when I started was not called AI, right? Um, For about 25 years now. And so it, it feels like yesterday and yet, given what's happening today compared to what's happened or what's, what's happening way back, it's so remarkably different. And one, um, you know, I started to code when, when I was 11 and I was always fascinated by uh, science fiction movies. So all of that sort of informed my choices as I was um, you know, building my career. People don't say that anymore. Uh, in uh, in adulthood, and when I when I stumbled into the world of uh, algorithmic science, um, roughly twenty five years ago, and, and how to push the boundaries of that, and how to productize on top of that, and how to build business model on top of that, I really, really began began to to enjoy it and and love it. And but the for the uh, for the following twenty plus years, I just dedicated my time to furthering the uh, that, the, the very uh, um, concept of pushing the boundaries of, of, the, of algorithmic science and trying to uh, build products and operationalize businesses on top of that. And um, one thing that I kind of... Um, you know, really believed in up until very recently is that, you know, as entrepreneurs and technologists, we, we think that the, the future is, um, is never too soon, right? We always expect the future, the future to come uh, and arrive earlier, and it always takes longer until about a year ago when, you know, the, the, the future suddenly happens. And that's... Um, that's a remarkable thing. And I think we're, we're living in remarkable times. I'd love to get to your thoughts on some of the acceleration we're seeing. But first, diving into your background in a bit more detail, one really interesting thing you were a part of was as CEO at Dejima when the firm worked on Kahlo, which I believe was DARPA's foundational project. That was a precursor to Siri. Could you tell me a little bit about your experience working on that project, what Kahlo looked like. Yeah. So when, when I started to, to work uh, with SRI and, and, uh, and we worked on this massive project that uh, DARPA had commissioned in early 2000s, uh, I think 2003 was the year when um, the project was started. Um, the idea was to uh, develop literally uh, a cognitive assistant um, that learns and organizes KALO, that was the, uh, the acronym. And pr- 
prior to this, prior to Dejima, I had been uh, the CEO of a company called Zai, which was developing you know, predictive grammar uh, systems where you know you'd built you'd built a you you start to type a word, the word would be predicted, the next word would be predicted, sort of the ancestors to um, large language models of today, and a very different technology, of course, but in terms of the output, similar. Um, and my, my, this company did very well. It was public. We went to the NASDAQ, 1.5 billion. So we, we had a very good story with this. And, but intellectually, the next phase, which was Dejima, was so much more um, compelling because the idea was, can we move to some fairly simplistic uh, grammar, grammar models to something that is like uh, a the ability to develop very quickly um, ontologies. Um, and we as humans, you know, have a, a remarkable way to just represent the world for ourselves, um, scientifically, uh, logically. And that's that's what um, Digima was able to do. We were able to very quickly, um, in ways that nobody had done prior, um, we were able to um, put together um, ontologies of specific domains that you could then interact with, very much like what ChatGPT does today uh, in natural language. And that model became the, the fundamental architecture of uh, this project with Kalo, um, where the idea was, can we deliver an essentially a, a smart office assistant. And um, it was a very ambitious. Um, a few people actually know that, uh, in fact, what became Siri was partially funded by the US taxpayer, right, to the tune of uh, a quarter billion dollars or so. And that was Kelo is very forward looking at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, if I look again at, at that time, and I think about what's happened over the ensuing 20 years, that was the, the very beginning of uh, thinking of, of a way to interact with machines, services, the internet, data, uh, workflows um, with, with natural language. You mentioned that it was around 2003 when you were beginning to develop this prototypical cognitive assistant and as many people will kind of remember, this is almost a, a decade before the AlexNet moment that really kicked off the deep learning era. And so when it comes to developing these ontologies for specific domains you're talking about, in my imagination, the architecture of this assistant, of the system kind of underlying the technology, probably looks very different from what most of us are thinking about right now. Could you maybe open up that box for us in just a little more detail? Yeah, it's it's if you think if if you if you will, this is more akin to a, a network of agents. So each agent represents a concept, um, and a, the the concept looks at a the network of agents look at at a sentence and claims part of that sentence because it understands it, quote unquote. And so it was more of a a dual process where in phase one, what you do is you take a, uh, a domain and just ontologically map it into an agent network, uh, sort of so somewhat hierarchical uh, view of the world. It's not fully hierarchical, it's networked, right? Um, like, uh, you know, a street will be connected to a number, uh, a street will be connected to a, a name of a street or a city and so on and so forth. Um, but it is semantic, right? The network is is a semantic representation. That's phase one. And phase two, you actually have this um, agent network, if you will, claim uh, snippets of um, what is being queried. Um, and so if the question is, you know, um, tell me where you live, uh, then uh, where will be claimed? Um, uh, as a as you know, look, location. I'm asking for location. Uh, live is obviously your residence. Um, you is well, it's yourself, right? So there's a, there's a, a person discriminator in there, 
and so on and so forth. And that's that's the how, that's how it was organized. And so, uh, so the tokenization here was actually interestingly semantic, um, not vector based. Uh, nowadays, it's very different. This is really interesting. I'd love to maybe move a little bit along your entrepreneurial path leading up to today. So you also co-founded Sentient Technologies, which I'm aware of boasted the title of world's highest funded AI company in 2016, I want to say. Could you tell me a little bit more about kind of moving forward uh, during this kind of phase of your entrepreneurial journey, this crosses paths with the deep learning era beginning? Could you maybe tell me a little bit about, in particular, how that transition for the world of machine learning impacted what you were doing, the technologies you were working on in your entrepreneurial endeavors? Yeah. So when, um, and, I, and I really think about it as a journey. So, you know, you know Zai was all about um, building the initial, you know, predictive systems for, natural, for, for language, then Dejima slash Siri was about building on, you know, queryable ontologies that let you do natural language processing. And then the next phase was, how can we begin to scale machine learning? So in sentience, the idea was scale is going to make the difference. And, and so we, what we did is we built a vertically integrated uh, company that had um, essentially three uh, layers to its name. The first is we had a uh, infrastructure level middleware, where before the cloud was what it is today, we were able to harness an enormous amount of compute across the globe. Uh, you know, sync um, game centers and internet cafes and universities and and things like this. And we we were able to uh, harness um, two point three million. Um, computers worldwide. We had a, a 4,000 compute sites globally. It's a massive system. At the time, if we had just uh, uh, you know, um, total the, the actual amount of capacity we were being able to access at any single time, we were able to, to access something like 25 petaflops, uh, which, was, which was enormous at the time. And, um, and we were one of the first user at scale of GPUs as well. We had about 10,000 GPUs online in a sort of 13, 14, 15 time frame. It's quite remarkable. So now, and we used this first layer was this. Second layer was, um, if I think of the stack, se second layer was the um, application, or, or rather the, the construction on top of this of um, um, algorithmic um, platforms, one which was uh, deep learning based, uh, and the other one which was uh, evolutionary computation based, so advanced uh, genetic uh, comp computation approaches. And by the way, the merger of the two, so we were among the first to conceive of uh, what is called neuroevolution, which is really the application of uh, um, evolutionary computation to uh, the discovery of um, uh, deep learning architectures, so the architecture search, uh, sort of the auto ML on steroids, if you will. And, and then the next layer above this was the application level. And there we had, um, uh, in that layer, we had uh, a, an e-commerce solution set. We had a online marketing solution set. Um, we had a, a short-term trading uh, hedge fund in, in partnership with uh, financial uh, stakeholders, and then we had um, research endeavors, especially in healthcare, uh, with MIT, for example. So that's what we did. It was, uh, um, and we were really, we was obviously we didn't scale deep deep learning um, deep learners to the to the tune at which they are scaled today. This was un unfathomable back then, but we were among the first ones to think that. Scale does matter, and uh, and we tried really hard to scale to scale to that to, to enormous levels, and we did. And so as a result, we were able to build several interesting products and do a number of spin-offs um, and monetize. Let's start with that observation about scale. Could you maybe elaborate on some ways that 
the scale of the underlying deep learning systems you were using manifested in the product upstairs, how that looked for people using it? Yeah, one thing we did was uh, what really interesting was collaboration filtering uh, approaches where we, we, we take um, we take the uh, a catalog, for example, we, I remember we, did, we worked with Zappos. Uh, we'll take a catalog of, of shoes um, and on a massive scale and we'd be able to apply uh, a, a deep learner to um, s- semantically um, um, representing that space on a uh, on a massive scale, and then present then um, a diverse um, a, um, a semantically diverse uh, model of that space to uh, online users by way of images. And as they were clicking on these images, they would progressively and very quickly narrow. Uh, things down to the the right shoe, and uh, this is very similar to what a, um, a a salesperson would do in a store, right? So when you enter a, a physical store and you point to a particular shoe in on the shelf, the salesperson will will immediately compute the uh, what you mean by pointing to that particular shoe. So this type of a shoe may be the shape, maybe the color, maybe brand, maybe something else, maybe the particular style and of the um, uh, the status that it represents. But there's a bunch of implied things that are uh, meant just by this gesture of pointing towards that shoe that will inform what the salesperson will do. And what he or she will do is come back with a choice. Oh, you like this shoe? Let me, sh- let me show you more. And and the more is completely a, it's a reflection of, of his or her processing of these features. And it, essentially what we were doing at, on a, on, at scale, and it was, a, it was a very interesting model and driver, you know, massive driver of conversions. Tell me a little bit about how evolutionary computation and neuroevolution factored into all of this as well. So, um, so we, we were um, big believers in the, the, the powers of, uh, evolution as a, a driver of um, I- improvement or other um, optimization uh, to your environment, and so you know, effectively, obviously, the, the human sp- species in many ways is a is an optimized uh, outcome to um, that fits well on the uh, earthly environment, right? And so. Um, the process is the same here. You're, you're using um, the process of uh, competition, um, um, culling, um, mutation, and creating offsprings to progressively create a population of um, hyper-adapted, hyper-optimized beings, in this case, just artificial beings. And the... the uh, the construct we we're optimizing for here was a, um, a neural network that is best addressing a a representation of the problem, right? So a neural network that is uh, the right topology, not just hyperparameters, the right topology and the right uh, hyperparameters for the particular problem. So. So very advanced at the time, um, and then uh, Google came out with OML, which is which was really focused on hyperparameters. And I think with what's happened today, I think um, there's still some work that's done on, on architecture search at the bleeding edge. But, been, but I think a lot of um, a lot of that has been a little um, obfuscated by a scale. Effectively, you know, with with scale, people do a lot of things now. Of course, it's not that simple, and there is. Um, um, configurations and fine tuning, and and also the operating of these massive neural networks that uh, on SLAs that actually do make sense, and that's not always easy. Um, but you know, in some ways, we were right that scale does matter. Absolutely, the idea of evolutionary computation, while it does feel natural and, and also very exciting, I think there have been a lot of interesting results. As you said, does feel like it isn't 
quite mainstream. One of my previous guests, Joel Lehman, worked a lot in this domain, and I think he has some really interesting research sort of going after that. But let's talk a bit about how you went from being an entrepreneur into being an investor. So in 2018, you founded Alpha Intelligence Capital. Could you tell me first a little bit about your your personal motivations for moving into investment? Yeah, so, you know, after 20, 20 years of hard labor uh, building companies, I thought um, this might be the time to apply the lessons learned and uh, help people like me, quote unquote, succeed, right? And so that's really what I did. And I was, to be honest, I wasn't quite sure at the beginning whether this was the right thing for me. Because as, you know, when you have the, the hand on the dial for so long, you know, will you be excited by, you know, this broad view and perhaps not deep view of, um, of the world? And so we sort of, we sort of at the beginning, uh, tried. Um, we put some of our own money and, um, see whether by doing a couple of deals we would feel right about it and we would be received right by the market. And uh, lo and behold, it worked. And then we decided to pursue um, and scaled. And so, and eventually what sort of started a small endeavor became something large because our first fund was almost 200 million. And then, um, uh, our, you know, we are, we are raising our second fund now, which is about uh, which we, we are aim, aiming at 300 to 350. We're about a third of the way through right now. And, um, to me, the most interesting aspect of everything that we've done over the last four or five years, and I'm just speaking from, you know, as a, as a former entrepreneur, is if you um, understand what's happening under the hood, then your journey as, a, as an investor doesn't have to be just horizontal and, and superficial. It can it can be very deep. And so sort of the can best of both worlds where you know, we get to see a lot of very interesting projects, a lot of very interesting people across a whole lot of different verticals and application spaces. And yet when we want to and when we need to, we can go very deep and get our hands dirty and, and go to the cover and help as needed. And that's really, really rewarding. So I'm just very lucky. Yes, as you mentioned, there is a lot of value in, in being technical, I can imagine, for an investor, both when it comes to evaluating companies, is this technology feasible? Is it worth investing in? And then in the aspect where you're actually helping them. Let's start with a bit of an overview about the investment focus you have, the companies that you've invested in. Could you tell me a little bit about what sorts of technologies you're most excited by right now, what you find yourself investing in, and also, I guess, where you're investing. Yeah. So we, we so what we do is we, we invest in deep AI companies, so deep tech AI firms globally. Uh, and that's, that's always been my thesis that if, if you really understand what's happening at the technology level, you understand the capabilities, but also the limitations of what you have, then your ability to use this to successfully productizing and, business, and building a business on top of it is, is, is better, right? So, and at the same time, I, I believe that deep algorithmic science is going to change the world. That's, you know, we saw it with Google. What is Google? It's a, you know, it's a search algorithm. We saw it with Meta or Facebook, it's a social graph algorithm. We saw it with TikTok. It's a recommendation algorithm. And those are massive companies that are built uh, upon essentially algorithmic science. So, so with this in mind, there are uh, many opportunities to build very large businesses on top of that. And the way that we look at the world is we apply this framework that was developed by the US Air Force um, back in the 60s, uh, the, OODA, the OODA loop, uh, OODA, uh, for observe, orient, decide, and act, which essentially split the ways that in this case, humans, but now machines, um, make decisions into three plus one uh, phases. The, you know, phase one is the first O, is observe, which is perception, right? Uh, the second is orient, uh, which is more cognition. So once you perceive the world, can you understand it in the context of uh, what you know, your training, your learnings, 
and so on and so forth. And then the D is um, decide, which is really the process of opt optimizing, uh, picking the best possible strategy. So outlining and picking uh, the best strategy, and then you decide. And then you act. And once you act, because you've acted, the world has changed, and you go through that loop over and over again. And and um, up until now, we um, I would say that machines were getting very good at perception, like superhuman perceptive capabilities. Um, for example, um, you know, think of uh, you know AI enabled radiology. Um, Right? This is not about understanding what's happening. It's about flagging, recognizing a pattern and flagging what's, what's happening. And um, so superhuman capabilities on perception, um, superhuman capabilities on certain types of optimization, right? So uh, for example, um, we've invested recently in a company that does inertial navigation systems where you're getting streams of data, right? And instead of using a run of the mill HMM, uh, you know, in Markov model, you're using an LSTM. Um, and, and, um, and lo and behold, then you're getting a lot better results. And here again, you've got same thing in, as in trading. You've got remarkably better optimization uh, outcomes from machine versus a human, like superhuman capabilities around optimization. Now, the last piece was missing here was always cognition. And, and um, I think we're you know, with, with Gen AI, um, we're beginning to see um, machines approximating uh, human cognition, sometimes doing better than human cognition in certain areas, sometimes doing worse. But the point is we're beginning to see that, that part of our capabilities um, uh, mirrored, augmented already by machines. And so now if you think about it, if you've got the, all the components of the loop now embeddable in a machine, then what stops a machine to actually um, really make the full circle across the board and make, you know, just complete the decision-making loop over and over again. So I think, I think we're now on the cusp of that, where, you know, historically we had machines focused on the narrow perception-related, optimization-related uh, aspects of the world, where it is now moving to a much broader scope, which is not, not just that, but includes um, cognitive aspects, which is super exciting. Yes, I do want to hear about how some of this impacts your perceptions as an investor. But since you mentioned the idea of going from an ML system being merely predictive, perhaps, and embedded in a fuller loop where the human is still involved when it comes to actual decision making, kind of going from that picture to the system itself doing the complete decision making loop. I think that there are a few different branches here. One is, of course, kind of the debates within the AI community about the possibility of machine systems really embodying, quote unquote, human cognition, however you think about it. But the second one that I'd love to put to you is about the safety and trust issues involved in all of this. I think that many people have observed that LLMs, they fail in pretty different and important ways. And that isn't to say that those aren't limitations that can't theoretically be overcome. But there was a very interesting paper on this set of fundamental limitations of alignment in large language models that sort of pointed out, well, if I train my large language model with some alignment method like reinforcement learning from human feedback to be aligned along a set of directions, no matter how aligned it is, I can always find a prompt that will misalign the large language model that will produce unwanted behavior. And so it seems like at least for the technologies as they are right now in this current paradigm, we do have these very fundamental limitations that are going to persist probably no matter how much we scale, no matter how much we align. And so I think that there is therefore a related worry about what happens if we try to remove the human from the decision-making procedure. But I'm, I'm curious how you think about all of this when it comes to some of those safety issues. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, just, you know, let's talk briefly about, you know, 
the this this aspect of whether we can get you know machines to complete the loop and do that in, in a way that um, is going to be super creative um, you know economically socially and, and and for sure it will right so um, there are things that we humans are are good at but machines are better at it right so um, the environment is a, good, is a very good example, right? The environment is a giant optimization problem. We will never solve it without uh, having AI in the loop. And AI not just being simply solving things like, you know, streams of quantitative uh, time series, um, but also qualitative issues, right? So, you know, how do we measure the wellness of a population, for example, right? Um, you know, are people happy, not happy? Are we, you know, is, if, if we just stop the, um, if we, uh, uh, you know, change the consumption um, patterns of the population, do we, are we able to keep that population uh, happy? For example, this is just a very simple example, but AI will, AI will be instrumental in solving the environment. Same thing with health, healthcare. We will, people ask me, well, you know, is, is AI dangerous? And I will say, well, AI will save us before it kills us <laughs> because it will make us live a lot longer, it will make us live a lot healthier. Um, and it's, and um, it will tell us what to do, when to do it, um, so that we stay healthy. Uh, it will tell us uh, when we need to go to the doctor and when we go to the doctor, the doctor will already know because the AI has told him that um, this is what we're suffering from. And so the, um, there's no question in my head that uh, this is a, a massively accretive moment in history. Now, to the safety issue, um, or, or maybe safety and ethical issue, right? Um, so first of all, there's a bit of a um, um, bias, which is a human bias towards uh, machines, you know, we, we tend to think of machines as um, perfect um, operators systematically. So, you know, if I have an accident, God forbid, uh, and some, somebody is injured, then that's not going to make the headlines in the paper. But certainly if a Tesla has an accident and somebody is injured, oops, it shows up. Why is that? Just simply because we have this bias that machines ought to be perfect. But what, as, as we begin to give machines more complex decisions to make, um, they will not be perfect. They'll start to make, they will make mistakes because the dimensionality, the complexity uh, of these decisions are, is just much higher. And so um, um, when I go to the doctor in the future, well, I feel more comfortable if the diagnostic of the doctor has been validated by a machine. Yes, I will, for sure. Um, will, um, will, will that change the perception of humans about um, you know, machines being you know, systematically perfect? I am not sure, but progressively we will develop more trust and in, in the machines and therefore We'll be able to let them make mistakes because overall we will trust them as a whole, like we trust each other as human beings, right? I will, when I go out and drive, I trust that the other human beings behind the wheel are generally well trained. Similarly, when I go out and drive, and you know, eighty percent of the drivers are computers, by then I will feel that well, it's okay, um, and so. I think there is a trust element here that has to happen, which will take some time. Uh, and if I go one level deeper now at the technology level, yes, of course, we're not there yet in terms of these large numbers of being fully, um, being full proof, uh, but we'll never get there. Just like we'll never get to uh, a humans being full proof, never. And so, if, if the reinforcement learning aspect is based on humans um, you know, assessing uh, the quality of an answer, well, of course, we're going to get the flaws of a of human being assessing the answers. Um, 
and but if if it was a scientific if if the if the assessor was a truth engine you know this is like you know the truth engine is, is a very hard thing to define the, if the assessor is a benchmark is the truth or the facts or science then um it becomes a lot uh, more difficult for machine to quote unquote hallucinate and so I think the way we've trained those models today, for sure, uh, means that we're getting to uh, uh, things like hallucinations. When when we start to train them on um, data that is much more constrained, that may be much more scientific, um, or we train them with uh, you know perpetual fact checkers, however we want to define this. Um, because what may be a fact to you may not be a fact to me, right? We, we know this problem. Um, but the more we think about what truth is and what science is, and, and we use these as benchmarks for training purposes, and that reinforcement learning aspects of learning of these models, then maybe we'll get closer to machines that are not foolproof, but um, but uh, you know better on average than what we have today, much better. Yeah. I think that there are, so you gave a number of important examples here, and I think that the automation bias certainly plays into some of these trust issues. And I I would suspect that there are a lot of people who, I think, given the argument you put out, would still maybe hold out different types of worries that I think are pretty valid. But I think it's worth acknowledging to the point you said that some of the conceptions of large language models as these kind of models of culture are a bit useful in thinking about what you just said, because I think that one sort of corollary of that is a model of culture, you know, sort of putting together everything that humans collectively have said, you get a sort of group wisdom out of that, perhaps. And when you look at certain application domains, you imagine creative domains, maybe that's not exactly what you want when it comes to taking everything over. But in other domains, that group wisdom maybe is precisely what you want. And so when you imagine certain sets of applications, then perhaps that makes sense. And so I think a lot of what's underlying some of what you said is maybe just a good discernment about where and when these things are going to be used and a better understanding of how that trades off with humans being in the loop at all or making the decisions entirely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one one very low hanging foot here is, is rather obvious, right? So if if you know if we assume that these systems are you know not semantic, not scientific, uh, not fact based, right? Which is you know partially true, um, at least partially true. Um, then at least when they are good at one thing, and that is language. And you know, language is a very important thing because we use language to communicate, to interface. So at least as an interface, the systems are very good. Um, now, you know, maybe you need to plug them into you know, a ontolo- ontological databases or scientific databases or um, in other, you know, uh, or the internet where, you know, you know, where suddenly the facts of the world emerge. But... We know at the very least that we, we have a phenomenal interface product. Um, maybe we can make it better than that. We can make it a true driver of um, you know, fact-based, science-based services. Uh, and I don't think we're very far from that. We need, to do, we need to apply some work and maybe we need to think about the architecture of it all or the learning process of it all in order to augment our chances of getting there. So one of the things you mentioned a little bit earlier was your feeling that we're living in this moment where progress seems to have accelerated significantly. And you're absolutely not the only one who feels that way. I think that other investors have pointed this out. I think that a lot of us who watch the field closely or are in the field can feel this warped sense of time. And it's it's an interesting experience. I do want to understand how that impacts you as an investor. I think others have kind of commented a little bit on how 
that maybe impacts the way they think about interacting with founders and companies and what to invest in. But I'd love to hear a bit about your perspective on some of these things. Yes. So the, the way I think about all this is that, uh, you know, a part of our, you know, bi biological brain processes is moving into the infrastructure layer. Um, where you know historically we had storage, we had some automated processes being you know worked off of the infrastructure layer of the cloud, but now we're going to get some intelligence and an increasing amount of intelligence. And so, if you think about it, um, this, this, there's a several outcomes that, that um, stem from this. Number one, well, if you if you are a cloud operator, you're going to do well because more intelligence is going to be um, located there. And that transfer of intelligence is essentially a transfer of compute cycles, and, um, and then you will, you will monetize this. So one big area of, of possible value creation is not so much in just doing another cloud, but it's in cloud orchestration. It's, it's how you make uh, you know, cloud um, services delivery optimal, from a cost, from an SLA standpoint, um, from a security standpoint, and so on and so forth. So that's number one. And the um, another area of, of, of clear value creation is at the um, uh, hardware level, uh, so the hardware below the infrastructure per se, uh, where obviously requirements for compute are going to go up significantly, um, and um, anybody who's got a, a, um, a significant uh, innovation uh, streak around um, the uh, native native processing of uh, uh, AI algorithms will do well. So obviously, NVIDIA is, is, has done very well, but I think there's a lot of interesting uh, application-specific uh, use cases going forward. For example, we invest in a company that does... Um, um, that really advances the opportunity of doing full homomorphic encryption um, on chips. And so, you know, you can do full homomorphic encryption today, but it's so time consuming and compute intensive that effectively nobody does it, um, except perhaps the military. Um, so, but going forward, do you want to be able to compute on fully encrypted data? You do, right? And because that's that's going to solve the issue of um, um, you know uh, um, uh, data protection, uh, data privacy, and you'll be able to build models on data that effectively you don't see, right? So I think massively interesting, especially in enterprise software. So companies like this will thrive. Um, people build these architectures, um, and then at the application layer, which is above. Uh, there is an interesting play because suddenly uh, the intelligence delivery has become much more commoditized. And so what's the, what's the angle? Um, how do you compete? I think you compete in a couple of ways. Uh, I think most importantly, uh, being able to really understand the nature of the problem. So historically, it was possible to have a technology and just find your market. I think it's going to be a much more diff difficult now. I think you really have to understand the nature of the problem to solve. And at the same time, you need to understand uh, the capabilities and the limitations of the underlying technologies that you use. Um, and, so, and then the third aspect of this is speed and quality of execution. So, um, speed is going to be important more than ever. Um, in some way, it's going to favor startups. Um, so people think our legacy company is going to be doing great because they've, you know, now the part of that technology ecosystem has moved much, 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 uh, you know, has moved into the cloud and therefore is much more accessible. I don't think it's that simple because the speed still matters. And, and, and so startups will... Uh, will do very well. Some of them will do very well, but they have to be quick. They have to execute. They have to understand the problem, and they have to understand the underlying technology so that they understand the limitations of what they use.
The final point you made about working backwards from the problem, I know that is sort of a framework that has often been pitched to people that, yes, you might get lucky like Google and just build a really cool technology and the product market fit kind of invents itself in a way. But for many, many businesses, that just doesn't happen. And so I think the the common phrase is, you know, rather than getting excited by using the latest new technology and being like, let's do something with this, you have to find a real business problem, a real thing to build, and then work backwards from there. And maybe that doesn't imply using the latest, greatest technology. But I think one interesting thing about the moment we're in right now, too, that you pointed out is given the ease of use and the ease to make something out of foundation models, out of the latest technologies, what that maybe changes about this mindset is, yes, you can work backwards from the problem, but maybe there are a lot of cases where the latest, greatest technology is going to offer even an incremental improvement over what you would have arrived at otherwise. And now it is going to be much, much easier to actually make use of that. And so the ordinary trade-off that you might have dealt with, where cost was a barrier, where the investment of time was a barrier, that differential is probably going to decrease so much, perhaps, that then the calculus you're engaged in changes. Do you, do you see things that way as well? Yeah, I, I completely agree. So, so you need to find an angle that isolates you from this. And, and whether it's... Um... It's data access, or it's you, you go to market, the partnerships that you create, um, I think it's really important. Let me give you an example. So we, we invest in a company called uh, Procia uh, in, out in Philadelphia that does sort of the, the, the next generation of you know, um, AI-enabled um, you know, computer vision-based um, uh, healthcare. So you know, I mentioned radiology prior, you know, AI-enabled radiology. Uh, this company does... Um, AI enabled pathology. So essentially biopsy slides um, that are looked upon by a computer on a, at a massive um, amount of granularity. And so because these are giant slides that no human eye can really decipher, to be honest. So, um, but, you know, why do we invest in that company? Not necessarily because they had the best technology, um, but because they had the best approach to uh, monetizing um uh, to, to um, uh, surfacing assets based on their uh, platform and then uh, going to market with it. And in their, in their uh, approach, the, the key driver was um, um, pathology is first about data. It's about um, being able to uh, understand, um, uh, to surface data, and then how do you monetize that data? And monetization can be in a at a hospital, uh, but also it can be at a uh, at a, a big pharma because so many large pharmaceutical companies actually do want to see the outcome of uh, treatments uh, on uh, patients with cancer, and uh, for for these companies that data is critically important, and so placing yourself at the center of, center of the ecosystem and saying. I, it's not about the diagnostic and the outcome. It's about the data that I get and how I monetize this is, uh, is really critically important. That's what they've done, and they've done it very well, and they're growing very quickly. And that's an example of you know, how you, you know, isolate yourself from, um, from the next guy doing the, the same thing and uh, competing with you and essentially on speed, uh, not on product. Yeah, that does seem like one of the best factors for isolation. And I think we are certainly seeing a lot of movement right now when it comes to different companies, organizations protecting access to their data. I, I believe Stack Overflow, for example, just recently announced that they were going to charge developers if they wanted to use Stack Overflow data for developing AI systems, which makes perfect sense. I mean, if you have the entirety of Stack Overflow at your command for training an AI system, then there's a lot you can you can do with it. Of course, you're going to run into issues, but just the speed of, I have a question about this code I'm working on, this bug I'm fixing, 
and being able to get to an answer. There do seem to be lots of ways for things like developer productivity to evolve in, in important ways. And so just finding that kind of data mode does seem to be one of the really most important things to to pay attention to here. Yeah, I think data is a big one. Um, and, and not just the data that you, not just the data you have, right? The data you have access to, but the, the data you generate, right? Uh, very, very importantly, um, uh, I think um, another another aspect is of this is, um, or maybe a derivative aspect is what you're learning. So, as as um, um, as you generate data, what effectively you can get from this is effectively an opportunity to learn. Um, so and 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 use this this data set to actually improve upon your model, you know, time after time. And so uh, I think the future of um, large language models or generally foundational models is not just um, a few very large models. That are used by everybody. Think of you know Google search, but now it is a large language model. It's not just that. I think it's going to be a lot of highly specialized, um, truth thinking, um, uh, constrained, uh, and highly specialized models that are use case specific, you know, industry specific, sometimes enterprise specific, um, and so you'll have. Um, you'll be you'll be able to invoke those different models, and they'll be sort of your, you know, local um, Wikipedia, if you will, uh, on, on steroids. So you will do much more than Wikipedia. It'll produce code, it'll produce workflow, and and other things and content, but it will be um, uh, so specialized that you'll have, you know, going back to this issue of trust, you'll have a high degree of trust in the outcome of this. Where the large model will be, in my view, mostly focused on the, the linguistics aspect, which is the interface piece. Yeah, the the idea of having this suite of tools that can augment us in different ways in different areas of life does seem like an exciting vision for the future. Perhaps to close out the section on sort of the state of AI today, you've already commented on a few areas, but I guess I'm just curious about if you could just give a rundown of what application areas, what research areas you're walking, you're watching most closely right now. So the, the, the main application areas which which we're uh, focused on are healthcare, biotech, first and foremost. A lot of uh, phenomenal progress there. Just the beginning. You know, there's not enough people in this industry. Uh, people want to live. Um, uh, governments want to reduce the cost of healthcare. So your this is this is a massive driver of value creation. Number one, number two, cybersecurity. Um, clearly, a, um, a very topical um, uh, issue is um, uh, cybersecurity is 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 not um, is, is 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 the uh, problem um, is the security problem going forward. Um, Especially as machines make, you know, get to make more and more decisions, we'll have to protect um, processes, workflows. We we'll have to protect infrastructure. Um, we we'll have to protect the cloud. Um, so there's there's a lot to do there, um, and there AI is going to have a major, major uh, contribution to make. Another aspect which we like uh, very much is anything that has to do with um, productivity. So um, whether it's in financial services. Um, uh, in sales and marketing, there's just there'll be an enormous amount of um, um, value created in uh, enterprise software that is focused on um, enterprise productivity. And, and, and as part of this, you can think of models where you know it's it's um, because of the gains in productivity you can make, you can actually think of building. Um, the next providers of services, you know, if so, it's not just about trying to offer solutions. Um, you can build new types of companies, uh, new types of um, you know service-based companies that are 
um, essentially AI first. Um, historically, they relied on human intelligence, and going forward, they will also re rely on human intelligence, but a little less, and and a little more on machine intelligence. And and the folks who get that balance right uh, will be able to create massive companies. I think this is a really good place to close. So perhaps as a final question, you've given some really great takeaways, I think, for entrepreneurs in this space. So I really, from kind of this conversation, see you as more an optimist about where everything is going. And I think that there are a lot of different ways in which people are interpreting the present moment. But I'd love for you to perhaps just give a summary of how you feel about where we are right now, where things are going, and perhaps what advice you would give to anyone in general who's just kind of watching everything that's going on right now and maybe not entirely sure how to feel about it. So my, my first advice is, a piece of advice is just get your hands dirty. Just try it. Uh, try to understand what it does, what it doesn't do. Try to understand the opportunities for value creation, but also limitations. And, and limitations will include things like putting wrappers around ethics and security, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm an optimist simply because you know I would not be investing in it if I wasn't. Right? And obviously, like everybody else, I'm asking myself questions such as, you know, are we inventing a novel form of intelligence? I believe we are. It's not exactly human. But it is, um, it is still valuable. Um, it is superhuman in some ways, uh, subhuman, I don't like the word, in other ways. But uh, it is uh, a different type of intelligence. Uh, it behooves us to, A, make the best of it, so that it complement, uh, uh, complements ours and augments us. Um, and I think we can do a great job of that. And B, to make sure that it is un well understood and understood enough so that we can uh, preempt the risks that come with it. You know, we have, as humans have, have never denied uh, the advances of technology. You know, it, it takes time. And when it's so brutal as it is today, major questions are asked and they are relevant um, because it's so fast also. Uh, and we don't have time to react. And so I think um, you know, being able to understand it and being able to uh, think not just about uh, the value, but also how we harness that value properly is critical. I can see that the debate is there and it's very healthy because, you know, what we're six months into this or nine months into this and already we have a major debate I don't think we ever got that quickly into that kind of a debate prior, right, to to this happening. So in many ways, I think what's happening in terms of the debate is very healthy. Um, let's make sure it doesn't prevent us from innovating because I think the answer is not in debating. The answer is in, well, of course, the answer is the outcome of the debate, but mostly the answer is in innovating. I think innovation will give us the answer that we need to have in order to be able to make sure that, we, that what we're building is, is a massive and positive. Um, so, and I'm very confident we'll get there. I appreciate the perspective. Well, Antoine, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed hearing about your experiences and your perspectives on this wild, crazy moment we're all living in. Thank you for your time and for speaking with me. Thanks, Daniel. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.